Welcome to Archaeology Books for Fun, a podcast where we discuss books that are about archaeology but anyone can enjoy. I'm your host, Tristan Herrenstein, and with me as always is my co-host, Barbara Clark. Hello, hello, everybody. We see that people are out there and enjoying our podcast, and that makes us really happy. If you can take the time to leave us a review, if you're listening to this as a podcast, or if you're listening to this on YouTube, give us a like and subscribe. It gives us some nice feedback and lets us know what people think. It also helps us to get the word out there and and let other people know that this podcast exists. And if you have a book recommendation, hit us up. Let us know. Yeah, because we'll be on this book for a little while now. But after that, we don't have a plan yet. So if you have any suggestions, do send it our way. Last time we finished Captain Kidd's Lost Ship, The Wreck of the Cata Merchant. And we had, uh, it gave us some problems because it wasn't quite the type of book we were looking for with this sort of podcast. We uh, still enjoyed it, and it it serves its purpose for what it is supposed to be very well. It's just not quite what we want. So this time we are starting a new book called Four Lost Cities, A Secret History of the Urban Age by Annalee Newitz. And uh, not to get ahead of ourselves, but I think we're in more of our territory here. Definitely. Definitely. So we have four lost cities. We're going to start with talking about Cattle Hayuk. And uh, without further ado, oh, we want to add uh, there is, if you're, especially if you're reading along with us, there is a trigger warning um, because there is a discussion about suicide. Um, I don't know that we need to go into that too much in this podcast, but I just want to make sure people are aware of that if you are reading along. And it's really just a brief mention. Right. So don't let it dissuade you from reading this book necessarily. Yeah, but you can you can decide what you need to do for yourself, of course. Yeah. All right, so starting off with our introduction, I think this is basically introducing the whole book. We're not specifically talking about Kata Hayuk yet. And in fact, it actually starts off talking about Anchor. And, yeah, Anchor Wat, yeah. And this is one reason I, I'm happy that we're reading this book, is because it, there's a lot of personal anecdotes. The author is good about putting herself into these places, talking about what she's experiencing, and that helps it just be much more accessible, I think, and and more readable. Yeah. And I like her writing style a lot. Um, She uses really, really good imagery, which helps put you there. And I also have to shout out to the author and whoever did the illustrations of the cities at the beginning of the section. They're super cute. Yeah. And fun. I love it when adult books... (laughs) have fun illustrations because we like illustrations too yeah especially when they add something yeah yeah so she's at anchor and she's kind of marveling at how what it must have looked like in its heyday and how cool this place is and then an archaeologist comes in and kind of ruins everything with facts gosh darn it gosh darn it (laughs) and so an archaeologist she's with uh starts talking about how actually poorly designed this place was and how it was uh, the des- design was made for politics or faith rather than actually sound engineering. And as as any good archaeology interpretation, she points out, it's like, oh, that gets kind of like a lot of our cities today. So we have an opportunity to to learn from some of this and and maybe understand not only how other people lived and why they made the decisions they're making, but also we can look at things that happened in the past and how people did things in the past and how we can actually learn from those things. I really, that's like, that's a continuing theme in this book, I think. And I find it interesting just because we hear that as archaeologists a lot in different contexts. And it does sometimes make me wonder if we actually do learn from history because the old adage is we're doomed to repeat it, but we kind of always seem to repeat it. So it just, I kept having that recurring thought in my head as I was reading this book. maybe a little overly optimistic, but maybe you could rephrase it to be something more like, we have an opportunity to not repeat it, even though we still probably will. (laughs) Right. We are, after all, creatures of habit. Yeah, that is true enough. Another theme that I thought was pretty interesting in this book was the idea of the lost city and Mm -hmm. how they aren't really truly lost, but it seems like you know, an explorer or somebody always comes in and 
dubs it as a lost city when, in fact, in the case of Angkor Wat, there were still monks living there. They were still managing parts of it yeah. anyway. Yeah. People knew it was there. People in the area knew it was there. And even explorers before the one who dubbed it lost acknowledged people were there. But he comes along and calls it a lost city. Look what we discovered. The book does a good job of like talking about why people kind of gravitated towards that. It's a dramatic and and it's very, very exciting. And yeah, people really like that story. And but another, they weren't. Lost. Oh, yeah. Another thing that is interesting to me is how the, the economics of cities and the different classes that exist within the cities mm -hmm. and how they interact and how cities change the inter the interaction between these groups of people. And one thing I thought was interesting is how she discusses the fact that the wealthier or well, more well-to-do classes are able to leave and the middle or lower classes are left to try and pick up the pieces and keep the city running as best they can. And I found that interesting because, I mean, I know we have only read about one city thus far, but in her introduction, she's talked a lot about it a little bit, too. And I think it's a, a theme we're going to see recur with the other cities as well. Yeah, social stratification, as it's called, and how that affects things and what form it takes, because that's actually especially interesting in our first city, which again, not to get ahead of ourselves, but um, that's one thing I found very interesting with that one in particular. And also then political instability coupled with environmental crisis. Yes, yes, that was basically happened every time, um, <laughs> she said, that there's uh, some maybe poor decisions made and then some environmental instability comes in and causes stress through a lack of food, through flooding or whatever. And that causes more political instability, which ultimately leads to the, I don't know if death of the city is accurate term, but abandonment mm -hmm. maybe. Well, and like her discussion, um, going back to uh, the locals knowing about the existence of these different cities and how they know about them, but they don't really know much about them is interesting to me because it reminds me of how many times we've been at events and we mention Native Americans in Florida and people are surprised by mm -hmm. that. So with that being said, I encourage everybody to go out and, and uh, explore their local environment because I think we all have a tendency to get enamored with something far, far away and exotic, and we forget what we have in our own backyards. Yeah, that's we're going to get an example of that, I think, later on, too. People in, we, so we are in North America doing public archaeology, and a lot of folks just like, tell us about Egyptian archaeology, which is cool, but they don't really even understand that we have amazing places here, and we're going to talk about Cahokia. Sorry, I had Cattle Hayek in my head. Yeah, so we'll talk about Cahokia here eventually, and that's that's here in North America. And we've got other stuff, of course, too. Not that the other places aren't amazing, but also you've got stuff right in your backyard no matter where you're at. So next we will go over, she just kind of summarizes each of the cities she's going to talk about. Um, since I, I figure we'll probably get into these in depth, I don't know that we need to talk about them too much. Except one thing that did stand out to me and I wanted to bring up was Pompeii. Yeah. I thought that was cool because... We always hear the narrative of the volcano erupts, it's buried, everybody dies, and it was lost forever. And in fact, about half the people got away, and there was actually a really thorough and large-scale reclamation effort that the Roman government at the time tried to tried to do. Yeah, and they had a huge relief effort trying to help the people that were displaced, and it makes sense, right? Because that's what we do today. Um, when something like that happens, right. but we don't necessarily put that human or humanitarian element into our history. And they were people too, and they would want to help each other if they could. Yep. I think it adds a real human element to it that miss is missing. And the fact that they knew they lived in a dangerous area and they had experienced nat natural disasters previously in the form of earthquakes. You, you don't hear about that in our minds. It's just this like random explosion and everything's covered in ash. And oh, there we go. That's Pompeii. But there's a lot more to it, a lot more nuance. And then to bring us into our first city and our first chapter, I have a nice quote from the book. 
that I thought summed up a lot of what we're talking about here. To understand why people fled, I needed to understand why people had come and how they had worked to stay. So that brings us into our first one in particular, which is Cattle Hayuk. I love at the beginning where she talks about how um, she walked into the, a portal of the distant past. Mm -hmm. uh, here in Tallahassee, we have a living history museum. It's a Spanish mission site called Mission San Luis. And you walk out of the visitor center and there literally is like a gate and you walk through the gate. And it reminded me of that. You walk into the past and all of a sudden, you know, there's living historians walking around in period attire. And it's such a powerful feeling to just experience history that way. And her talking about the portal to the distant past made me think of that. Yeah. And I like how she actually starts by observing a modern city as she travels to less and less urban areas to ultimately get to this basically first city as far as we know. Um, although we'll talk about <laughs> whether just... or not we call we should call it that, but the first urban environment, we'll put it the that proto -city. way. Proto-city. <laughs> Proto-city, yes. If so, if people aren't aware of Cattle Hayuk, it can be a little hard to look up because they use a lot of letters in the name that we don't necessarily use in English. But essentially, this was, and so when we start archaeology, start learning, studying archaeology, basically Archaeology 101 starts, one of the things you're going to talk about is Cattle Hayuk. And so Barbara and I both have some exposure to it, but nowhere near the depth that we're getting into in this book. So this is kind of fun. But it was a unique kind of city because it, the, the book describes it as few streets. I understood there were actually no streets, as we would think of them in today anyway. So that would be interesting. I'd like to see some map of that sometime and, and try and figure out what she's talking about. But essentially, all of the buildings for thousands of people were built right next to each other with no passages in between. To get out of your house, you would go up a ladder through the roof. Yeah, so your streets were essentially rooftops. Yeah, and you also uh, rooftops were a place where you lived as well when it was too hot and things. And so people would travel along the rooftops going up and down ladders and then ultimately down ladders to get out of the city. And so it's a very interesting design. And as we'll kind of get into it, it's, it's a design that kind of comes up when people don't have any idea of what uh, urban planning is. This was entirely a new concept. I, I thought she did a really good job of kind of breaking down about how disruptive and new this kind of idea was. I kept thinking about I used to live in an apartment and I lived on the first floor and I could hear my neighbors above me and I cannot imagine being in an urban environment where my roof was essentially the thoroughfare right people just walking across <laughs> and it. how annoying that would be so I just have this very and I don't know if it's accurate or not but in my my mental image of this place is just this relatively speaking bustling place compared to what these people would have been used to otherwise. Mm -hmm. And the almost the culture shock that I think people would have experienced would have been pretty drastic. Yeah, because we, we talk about how people before this were living in small, usually nomadic groups. The, everyone in the group is more or less your family. You know everybody there. And your, your tie is not even to a place so much as is to the people you're with. Whereas you move into this monstrous city with all these people you don't know and now you're now you're stable you're not moving anywhere where do you what do you identify with and that was a big part of the conversation but before we before we get to that i'm getting ahead of myself here i liked so there's a bit of description on the archaeological site itself and essentially they've been doing this at the point of this book 25 years so now we're looking at over 30 years of excavations at this site and when I guess when you're doing uh, such a detailed excavation for that long, you have an opportunity to build what sounds like a couple airplane hangars over the excavation of a, a, that's the size of a city block, essentially. Yeah. Which is monstrous, but so cool. And the author does such a good job of explaining both the layout of the excavation itself, as well as a lot of the archaeological terms that mm -hmm. are being used, like stratigraphy and things like that. It's very, very accessible, in my yes, opinion. Yes, agreed. And so she describes standing above the floor of a house and looking at the plaster in the walls, and there are red ochre patterns in the walls. And to quote the book, 
as if the painters wanted the never-changing settlement to feel charged with frantic life. And this is something I found interesting in these three chapters in particular, because I hear something like that, or there's, uh, this happens a few times, especially early on, where it feels like she's projecting our perspectives on these people and presenting it kind of almost as if it, this is the way it was. And that seems like it happens a lot more at the beginning, but then as the chapters go on and on, it becomes a lot more of, but actually there's also this interpretation and this interpretation. And also we need to be careful not to put our interpretations on these things. And I'm, I wondered if you picked up on that. Yeah. Too. And it was interesting to me because there were a couple of times when I was reading through the chapter and she would make mention of something and I'm like, oh, that's a little idealistic uh-huh. or simplistic or, you know, yeah, that's very academic and all. Or but... uh, uh, archaeologists will do this, too, is like they were using these symbols and that's what these symbols mean. And all their other archaeologists are like, but how do you know that? Right. You there's know? like the whole joke about the um, ceremonial object. If we don't know what it is, it must be ceremonial. Right. And, you know, she talks a, a little bit about, like, you know, I don't want to get too far ahead, but like pseudoscientific theories mm-hmm. and the problems that they can cause for a site, how they can essentially take us away from the actual archaeology. And I, I, yeah, there were a few times where I was like, no, this seems very, very cut and dry. And it's really like that. Right. But then she kind of backtracks and she's like, but actually, and I'm like, ah, there it is. And that, I mean, to me, that's that's kind of how archaeology occurs, right? We come up with now, these theories yeah. and we find more things and we're like, oh, that theory is not correct. And I think it's really important for people to realize that because so often people get caught up in an idea and that's fact and they forget that archaeology is ongoing. It's right? a science. Yeah. And if new information presents itself, it needs to change. Yeah. And it doesn't make the previous theory, quote, bad or whatever or wrong or wrong it we wouldn't have gotten where we are if we hadn't come up with that first original theory so right. it builds on itself and so i like the way she kind of and we need uh one moment to actually define what we mean by theory in this context because there is the use of theory where we use every day which we just kind of means a guess but when we're talking about scientific theories it means essentially based on All the information we have, this is the way it works. And essentially, the way archaeologists and scientists approach a theory in that situation is, uh, this is reality until we know otherwise. And then when we and when we know otherwise, then the reality changes. And so that is an important thing to kind of keep in mind as we talk about some of this, too. Yeah, I, I felt like she was actually leading us into these concepts because well, we started and i was like oh this is going to be problems if we're going to do this all throughout I'm, I'm worried about this and then like she starts to change like slowly like add more and more nuance I'm like oh i think that was intentional and it was a good way of kind of leading us into some of this i kind of got that feeling too and one of the reasons why is i went back through my notes and i remembered i made a comment about Potter, the archaeologist working there, and how she says he's the opposite of Indiana Jones. And I wrote in the margins, yes, thank you. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Because, sorry, guys, we're about ready to um, make a bunch of people upset, but Indy is the worst archaeologist ever. And I wonder if she added that in there at the beginning to kind of lead us on that path to understanding. It's different. Yes. Right. Yeah. Yep. We we enjoy the Indiana Jones movies. They have their problems, not just with archaeology, but they still can be very fun. We don't mean to take that away from anybody. Just be aware that it's not necessarily reality. You're still allowed to like Indiana Jones. You're still Jones. allowed to enjoy it, yes. <laughs> New movie coming out, actually, I think. Yep. We'll see if this one's good. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see. Yeah, you, so you mentioned Ian Hodder, who is a actually another archaeology, well, probably archaeological theory 101 name that we learn about because he was very instrumental in uh, they don't name it in the book but essentially he what did a lot of post-processual archaeological theory and he was very big on developing a lot of that so he isn't he's the only name in the book that i have actually known she does a good job of naming who she's talking to but i don't know anyone except for this one and, and i don't know him personally to be clear either but i just i've read his things because they made me <laughs> right <laughs> 
Um, but he's also very well known, as we see here, for working with Cattle Hayek itself. He's been making a big career out of that. I, there was a comment about archaeologists referring to upper as more re recent being confusing. And maybe that's just me being so used to the concept. But I was like, really? Yeah, I I was curious about that, too, because I've talked to children and I always use the analogy of your laundry basket. Yeah. Like, you know, at the beginning of the week, your clothes go in and they fall to the bottom of the laundry basket. And then as the week goes on, the newer clothes are at the top. And I feel like people understand that. And um, I think maybe people understand the concept, but sometimes in language or conversation it can maybe your mind doesn't needs to flip it and it's not something that everyone does automatically and i i also wonder too if people necessarily realize that just like geographic ge or geological layers archaeology kind of does the same thing with stratigraphy you know different cultural periods end up being kind of i mean it seems obvious to us as archaeologists, but I do wonder if it's obvious to the public and if mm -hmm. anybody listening has any commentary on that. I would love to hear it. Yeah, if you think we're crazy and it is really confusing, let us know because honestly, I, we would need to know that. Yeah. That's something that we make sure, need to make sure we are clarified when we're talking to people. So we're looking at uh, one of the houses now and it's fully excavated and looking at the profile specifically. And I thought this was cool because the profile is alternating black layers and brown layers. And so they explained that the black layer is when a house was abandoned, all the things inside of it were burned. And then also uh, neighbors just started using it as a garbage pile. And at first I was like, wait, that's weird. But then I realized they're Doors are on their ceilings, so it makes just, sense to kind of toss it in there right. and boop, be and done with it. And especially if the alternative is to walk over how many, how many houses and oh, up and down so many ladders to get to the edge of the city to throw your garbage away. Yeah. Like, heck yeah. Yeah. And then, But then when a new family came in, they would basically plaster it over with lighter colored clay and make a new floor on top of everything rather than just dig it all out, which makes a lot of sense too. And so this gives us kind of a life, a pattern for the city of things being abandoned and reclaimed over and over, over 1500 years, this community was existing in some form. Oh, one thing I thought was interesting in this is how she related to her historic house that she lives in, her 100 year old mm -hmm. house. And how we do the same thing today, right? We make the old new again to live in. Of course, people build houses and stuff too. But again, I really like the way the author tries to relate the people who lived in the past with us today. Yeah, I noticed that. And then, but my thought too was right before this, she talks about how every time a new family came in, uh, the sleeping, cooking, and burying of the dead all happen in the same place. And if we were to move into a new house, there's usually a lot of renovation. Then I got to thinking, well, no, the kitchen stays in the same place. The bathrooms stay in the same place. You know, there's a lot of it changes. But also, I feel like this is another example of some of the nuance being added in later, because later on, she talks about Dido and how the hearth was moved three times. Well, that's not the same place, right? So I feel like she's starting off again with a kind of a, a simpler interpretation of what's happening. And it may be relative. It may be the same corner or something. But the idea here is that we're it's doing the same things. But also there are we do see there are more variations because kind of my mantra is humans are complicated and we do a lot of complicated things. And if there's an easy answer, usually it's not a complete answer. So let's see, talking about the dig a bit more, only about 5% of the city is uncovered, which is tells you a lot about how big this is and how much work this is. And I think it's important to point out, because I was just talking about this the other day with somebody, how archaeologists very rarely do a complete excavation of a site. Mm -hmm. We're taking samples where we have a research question we're trying to answer and we're not just there to dig up things for the sake of digging up things. And I think that's important to note. So it will be interesting in the future to see how much they excavate here and why, because mm -hmm. there has to be a why. Right. And have questions you're trying to answer. Something that I found fascinating because I am obsessed with, uh, Residue analysis. I do not do residue analysis. <laughs> I just think it's really cool. 
they found the first evidence of cooking with dairy products at this site. And they did they found this by analyzing residue that was on ceramic vessels, essentially. So they cooked in this pot, whatever they cooked in it left a little bit of itself behind, essentially. And they were able to analyze it using chemistry and who knows what other sciences to figure out the makeup of what they were cooking in that pot. And that is so cool to me. Are you talking about the dairy line? Yes. I thought that was so cool. Like, oh. There is a point we can see exactly when they start using dairy. Yeah. Like, that is so cool. Yeah. And it seems so insignificant to me, like whoop de doo right? Right. But then you start reading about why it is important. And the adaptations that had to happen. Yeah. To that. And People were like, not adapted to. Wah. I never like drinking lactose. As yeah, it yeah. And how it just changed. And I think her conversations about how, you know, before this city or proto city, whatever you want to call it, before this particular development in human history, we were nomadic and we kind of were living within nature and how and she talks about how the city was us essentially realizing we supposedly have the capability of creating our own environment and changing nature to suit us at least to some degrees yes yeah right, right. and that we can argue all day about how successful we have been at that and what right. the uh you know ramifications of that are but essentially that's in a very simplistic way that's mm-hmm. what's happening when we create urban environments I had a good moment where she starts talking about Marxist theory, and I I made a note here that this is how you talk about theory because I thought it said it's such a good job of breaking it down and how what it meant for archaeology and how it influenced the thought of the time, and also this is actually a good example of what we were just talking about how new information changes how we view the past because we start off by looking at the Neolithic Revolution which was basically that started in one place and it swept around the world in a matter of a few years, like the Industrial Revolution. Whereas, in fact, it started in a couple different places. There's just a lot more nuanced than that. And in in a similar way, reality for the, the shift to urbanization happened like that, too. There are lots of stops and starts. And actually, I liked, I think this is in the introduction, where she said that Cattle Hayek went so poorly at the end that it almost let people led people to give up all urbanization as a lost cause. This is a bad idea. We shouldn't do that anymore. I thought that was a funny way of putting that. Um, and that would probably f- fly for about any of these cities. And like, oh, I'm done with that nonsense. And I thought the, the fact that there's been several examples in human history where different culture groups independently came up with similar ideas. It just fascinates me, whether it be a mm-hmm. tool, a way of living. It just goes to show how we all, even without knowing each other, we are somewhat linked, you know, and we're all looking to solve the same problems. And a lot of times we come up with very similar solutions to those problems. And I just think that's fascinating. And I mean, to think, you know, independently, all these societies or groups of people were coming up with the idea of urbanism is fascinating and it and like she talks about you know it has its good it has its bad right with urban urbanization you get people living in closer quarters more garbage more disease more right. you know rodents things like that so there's the good and the bad and the cities kind of attract the things that cause the bad things to happen like plague and it's just it's a complicated web of the good and the bad. And it, it just, you know, she does a really good job of not making it too idealistic. She like we've talked mm-hmm. about, she kind of might start off with a very simplistic, idealistic view of something, but then she kind of breaks it down. It gets into more and more depth and yeah. detail. And, yeah. So we talk about how kind of we domesticated animals and ourselves essentially by making this shift over a long term. I thought this was fascinating. So a tendency towards uh more she called it neoteny which was a new term for me but more delicate faces less body hair so looking more and more youthful essentially rounder jaws it actually let us talk use some of the language we use today like v's and f's were actually not potentially possible for people 
around this time. And then, of course, we also, and this wasn't in here, but this has uh, been in the news recently about uh, gut microbes and mass extinctions that happened in our guts around the time when agriculture started. Essentially, these guts all re- relied on multiple a variety of foods that we were eating when we were nomadic, and we switched to only a few foods. A lot of them just kind of went extinct. And so there's been some studies about trying to get at some of these gut microbes and what don't we have anymore and what might the health consequences be? Because there are there are some linked health consequences to not having these anymore. And it's all very fascinating. But yeah, we also, of course, influenced animals, as we are aware, although I liked especially the fact that pigs have an extra rib now because it's yummy. <laughs> Oh, and speaking of animals, the whole conversation about animal imagery that they find Mm -hmm. is interesting. And some of the, like here, I kind of started thinking like, oh, I want to see more proof to a lot of it because they were, they had all these theories about how it was, you find like these animal trinkets and animal imagery painted on walls and what have you. And they have these theories about how it was their way to assert authority or derive power from either the animals or nature. And as I was reading this, I looked around my house and I have animal imagery everywhere. And it's just because I like animals. Right, you know? right. <laughs> like I ride horses, so I have horse trinkets all over my house. It has nothing to do with anything bigger than that, you know? So I feel like sometimes we get these grandiose theories and it you know it takes a lot of evidence to prove that and sometimes i wonder if we actually have that evidence yeah yeah there's there's a lot of decorating with with skulls and teeth one that stood out to me is what you're talking about too was we weasel predator and scat placed in the graves because this would combine grave dirt with a dangerous predator with symbolic power political authority and i was like i feel like this is a lot of conjecture here and again we we start there and then she moves us to a more nuanced or involved perspective as we go, which uh, at this point I wasn't didn't know we were going to do yet. So I was glad to see that. eventually. Yeah, I started at this point. I started thinking to myself, oh, no. Yep. Yep. <laughs> this was good. But yeah, she she builds on it, which I appreciate. Another new concept that people had to deal with was concept of privacy, because before they actually started living in such large concentrations of people, you knew everybody. You could just walk away and get some space if you needed to. But when you're in such a big urban environment and you have to walk across rooftops and stuff, you don't can't really do that. And so essentially they started developing a concept of the home being a private place for a family. And it was not necessarily a public space. Well and I thought it was interesting too how our I their identities may have changed, you know, and like, I'm a Floridian, Mm -hmm. or I'm a New Yorker, or I live in whatever neighborhood wasn't really a thing. And now your identity kind of becomes bound up. And she talks about how it becomes bound up in their physical objects and how there's some evidence of that here in some of the artifacts they were finding and the imagery and other things and we I know I'm getting ahead of myself but I just thought it was an interesting concept like how the concept of privacy kind of changes the way we identify ourselves oh she talks too about uh speaking of like identity she talks about monumental architecture and how there really isn't any here you know usually cities they have temples or they have you know your town Mm, hall or the arena, like you and I were just recently in Lisbon and there was the bullfighting arena. Right. You know, there, there's something that people can point to and say that is from that city or this is where people, you know, tend to congregate. And there isn't any of that here, which is strange, but interesting. But also maybe not. Again, getting ahead of ourselves a little bit. There is uh, something called history houses, which may have fit that need a little bit, too. True, yeah. Uh, I, I wondered about that. Yeah, and it. Th- this is just such a, this is like the outlier, and I, I don't want to get too far ahead, but this is why Tristan and I have kind of hinted at the fact that some people debate whether or not this can actually be called a city. But, but leading us into the concept of uh, monument architecture, she talks about a site I don't think I've heard before, and I'm not going to try and pronounce, 
And it's a cool site. And I could see how this could be seen as a precursor to something like Cattle Hayuk. It was essentially not people living together, but it was a monument of architecture. People congregated and became you know, worked on connections and had a unified idea that united them all. And it kind of led, I think she's making the case that it led to Cattle Hayuk. She also talks about how urbanization actually led us, kind of caused a culture shock that we even still feel a little bit today. And I could, I like to see some conversation about that in a little more depth, but I can kind of understand that, you know, we think of a lot of these big changes happening in the past and it's not, it's done now. And it's like, I made the point recently to my dad that, you know, we think of the, we're still trying to figure out how to deal with the industrial revolution. And we think of that as being a long time ago, nowhere near long as this, of course, but I think the the impacts of these and how we deal with these things are something that we are still trying to work out sometimes. So that leads us then into talking about how did they find connections with each other? If you're with all these people, they aren't your family, how do you connect with them? And so when we start looking at imagery they used as signifiers of who your people are. Ooh, are you talking about the the little clay token stamps. The, the stamps. Yeah, I liked how she described them about the size of a business card because it kind of seems like they served almost a similar purpose as a business card in some ways. Yeah, and I started thinking about the ways we do this today, but these individuals would have little tokens, little stamps, little clay. I, I kind of envision them as like little tiny tablets. Yeah. And they would walk around with them. Sometimes it, I believe she said they would possibly wear them. But it, they would have symbols on them. And she goes into talking a little bit about how the symbols became more abstract um, as time went on. Um, they never actually invented writing, but it seems like they were right on the cusp of kind of coming to that point. But they use these as a way to kind of identify themselves with strangers within the um, city. And I started thinking about all the ways we kind of do this, like especially, you know, think about colleges and fraternities and sororities and the Greek letters they use. And well, even our faith, you yeah, know, your people faith, wear a cross, crosses, you know what yep. that is. If they wear a Star of David, then you know what that means. You yep. know, there's all these little ways of symbolizing who our, our groups are that we yeah. do. Yeah, and it, it just, to think that people at some point didn't necessarily do that. They is were really, working out how to do that yeah, right here. Yeah, it's, it's really so cool. cool. Yeah, and so, yeah, they get more abstract and this is, again, it's an interesting idea. Uh, so the, the pendants tended to be used uh, were generally animals or body parts. In particular, I guess, phalluses were a key feature. And like, so human, you know, <laughs> if that's what you're going to do. <laughs> Although she makes a point that we don't know what these symbols meant to the people who use them. We have what we could ascribe to them. That doesn't necessarily what they mean. And then I liked how she described how they got more abstract to a point where they're just a triangle and to the point where people who were using them may not even know the source for, for what that symbol meant, which is that's just kind of fascinating. But I liked this quote in particular. I had to share it because this has to be intentional. From the book, it says, these phalluses have aroused a lot of debate amongst archaeologists. I got a good laugh at that. Me too. Thank you very much. That was a great little joke. And I'm glad you brought that up. <laughs> yep. Yep. I had to write that down. That was so funny. Moving on to chapter two, we start with talking about who we have named Dido. So we don't know what the person's name, of course. This is the name that archaeologists have ascribed to this individual. This is a female skeleton in Cattle Hayuk that was found. Uh, we've kind of alluded to this, but I guess we haven't said it explicitly, that people were buried under the beds of, of the sleeping area in these ho in their own homes and to us that is weird and strange and creepy but of course that is that is not necessarily how they viewed it it may have been comforting it may have been keeping your family close we have to keep in mind that uh, our view is not necessarily what we are experiencing here and there's other cultures that did similar things too i can think um there was some in like Indonesia, the Philippines, mm -hmm. that kind of area. And I believe possibly some Native American tribes here in North America, maybe. I'm not sure. But I I loved her kind of how she used Dido to create a story. Yeah. And one thing that was kind of shocking to me, and I know that she survived with her injuries 
Um, she fell possibly from a ladder. Um, you remember their doors were on their roofs. <laughs> And she landed on her hip, I believe. And she healed from the injuries, but she probably walked with a limp for the remainder of her life. Her remainder of her life being into her mid-40s, which was a very long time for this period. And I, I checked that because I know there are statistics out there that are misleading because they say, oh, the, the average lifespan was in the mid-20s or something sometimes. And the, what actually is happening there is you, when you do that kind of calculation, you need to exclude infant mortality from that or, or be clear that you're including that anyway, because essentially if people lived to adulthood, they tended to live much longer. So I, I did a quick check and this is mid forties is very old, old for this period. Uh, when people start doing agriculture, their lifespans actually decrease. And that's not a new thing to us. Uh, health in general decreases because you have less variety in your diet. And there are a lot of side effects. And we talked about the gut microbes, that kind of thing, side effects that come with agriculture. I liked how this is a good example of how much we can reveal about these past stories with, in the right situations with very careful archaeology. You know, as you said, fell and broke ribs, which must have bothered his age, but we can actually even see how favoring that side throughout the rest of her life put strain on the rest of her skeleton. You can see that in her skeleton. And I love, can I just say that I love that they use the example of a woman because I think one of the most powerful things about archaeology is telling the story of the everyday person, mm -hmm. the children, the women, the, the poor or middle class. You know, it's not just the people that, you know, it's that we write about in history books. It's not the people that did the big things. It's just a woman who lived her everyday life and yep. happened to fall from a ladder. Yep. There was also a bit where they found a black residue in her rib cage area, which tells us that she may have actually had black lung from smoke inhalation from poor ventilation all her life. Again, that's the fact that we can get at this these details are amazing. Yeah, because um I guess they did their only chimney was their door. Yeah. Which Again, was in the roof. And was probably closed some of the time. Yeah. So you can imagine how, and they found a, like soot residue and stuff on right. the walls and things too. So you can imagine how dirty and sooty that it may have been within each individual's house and probably outside too. We uh, get an interview with someone who writes speculative stories, which I thought was interesting concept. And I like the fact that we, we clarify, you know, what is speculation and what is not in this case in particular. Because uh, there is value in, like in our, our first book, there is value in historical fiction. It helps bring these things to life, helps make the people real, even if we have to take some liberties. But we also need to be clear about where the liberties are taken, generally speaking, and make sure that we're not misleading people into thinking that this was a thing when it's just kind of us trying to put together the best best guesses we have, essentially. We get a description of the city, what would have looked like to the people, so that it was uh, built on two low hills in the plains. And you have mountains in the background. You would see smoke from hundreds of rooftops coming through their doors, essentially. Remember, they didn't have chimneys. And then you have farmland surrounding the city. Although this made it sound like it was right up to the city walls, whereas later on we clarify we actually don't know where the farmland was. And it may have been even further away because yeah. of logistics of farming in that area. Yeah, just the, the topography and the geography of the area wouldn't have allowed for farming right outside mm -hmm. the walls of the city. And I like, just briefly, I won't go into too much depth, but her conversation about agriculture and how today we think of it as something that is opposite of a city, where in actuality, it's what makes cities possible, right. essentially. And especially in, in this case, it was more obvious because it had, only could exist because of the city. The city only could exist because of the agriculture. Right. And now we have grocery stores and we go to the grocery store. We don't know where our food came more from. Yeah. <laughs> but then, you know, you you knew where your food was coming from. And a lot of the people that lived here would work outside the city, either, you know, being shepherds or farming the land or doing what have you. Mm -hmm. So they would kind of come and go as needed. I This is something that occurred to me to think about a lot as we're discussing the city and everything. And that is the smell. She observes that probably it would have been not even noticeable to people living in it. But like I get like garbage and stuff, you throw it down, that would be very smelly. 
but also like sewage. Yeah. Where did that go? There has... wasn't really any mention of that. And to yeah. me, that's something I'm always curious about, right? Because right. the more people you have in an area, the more waste you have, both, you know, garbage and then also and how human you deal waste. deal with that and the disease that it would introduce yeah. is a huge deal. I did think that it was interesting that there really wasn't any mention of that. I was yeah. curious because there's not even really, I mean, when we think of cities, we think of you know, excavating privies, which sounds gross to our audience, but to us, we're like, heck yeah, let's do it. <laughs> People threw things down yeah, there. Yeah, right. they were garbage pits as well. So sometimes you find some really cool things in privies, but there's absolutely no mention right. of privies. And or... what would you do? Would you trek across the entire community to go relieve yourself? Or would you do it at home and then dump it down your abandoned house next door? Or how would you do this? Yeah. I, I kind of wondered, and I don't, we didn't get an answer in this one. So but I may if have to anybody look that up. who has any uh, information on that knows, yeah, we'd be we interested. May, we may need to do a follow up on next time, even like yeah. look into this and like we yeah. can bring it up. So we talk about what daily life would have looked like for uh, for Dido in particular. So attending the hearth in the morning, then you go through the ceiling to exit and to fetch food and water down. You know, climbing down the ladder again to get to the water. And uh, on the rooftops, you would see workshops, you'd see animal pens, outdoor uh, braziers, on bed rolls. even if it's in certain times of the year, people were sleeping on the rooftops. I like reading what her daily life would have been like exhausted me. Yeah. <laughs> like just the fact that you had to climb up and down a ladder to get out of your house. And if you wanted to, say, haul buckets of water or whatever to and from your house, you were doing that while climbing a ladder. No wonder that woman fell. Right. Yeah. I can't imagine being burdened with food and building supplies and water and going up and down ladders and never having accidents because... It makes me really thankful for sidewalks and front doors. No kidding. So in the house, we have, like we mentioned, bodies are buried under the floors. And this is not grisly in their, their point of view. So we have two adults and a child under the beds, and then two infants and a toddler bar buried near the hearth. And remember, we talked about infant mortality was very high at, at all these times, so this is not unusual. <clears throat> Dido in particular was buried under the beds with a basket that was actually associated with children quite often, which I thought was interesting because we still see today, we do a lot of headstone stuff, and we look at the symbols in the headstone, and sometimes that gives you clues and sometimes the clues it gives you is entirely misleading. Like sometimes there's certain things that usually go with a child burial, but every once in a while I'll see it with someone who is definitely an adult. So it's it's interesting to see that kind of, you know, it's like that's not how that usually is. I wonder what's going on there. It's always it makes me ask questions that I'll probably never know the answer to. And I have to accept that. So they speculate that she had several children die young and then an adult son and daughter later on. The older man, they think, is is her spouse. And the one of the children may have been a grandchild, and then the house was probably abandoned soon after she died, essentially. Now, they interacted with the human bones quite a bit, which is, in, I found this very cool. So they didn't have just like permanent burials. They would actually exhume them and uh, rebury them. In some cases, they'd have almost a crypt for them, it sounded like. And then sometimes they even used the skull and they would cover it in plaster and paint and mounted in the wall as keeping you again keeping your ancestors close by these are people who probably the stories are told about them it's a lot of conjecture but you can kind of get an idea of what this might have meant to people even if you don't know the exact answer yeah they even if i'm correct me if i'm wrong but they even had little i guess nooks. cubbies or yeah. nooks for the skulls so yes. they actually within their architecture were creating spaces for these which i think is significant and they're not always even relatives yeah. like they're uh, they Seems apparently like... were exchanged and moved around quite a bit which again is a fascinating thing we don't always know what's going on and i love that yeah no i love the whole conversation about exchanging them trading them and it's so different from what we do today right so they also in this house in particular found 141 clay figurines which brings us to some fun discussions about how people have made poor interpretations in the past and how we need to change our our perspectives once again yeah i, I actually have a note in my, the margin of my book that says pseudoscience sigh yeah <laughs> in the 1960s 
there was the first excavation of cattle Hayuk. Someone was investigating, didn't really even know exactly what he had at that point. And they found a few figurines that were female and they were, I think, described as vol- voluptuous. But there, you've probably seen some of the famous images from this period. They're um, larger women. Yeah, there a lot of people call them like Venus figurines. Venus figurines, yeah. Uh, I forget there's a famous one. I cannot remember the name of right now. I know the one, there was one in particular he found that had two leopards and the mm-hmm. woman, there was like a bulge yes. in front of the woman, which they assumed was a recently birthed child, but I don't know. There, like, There's yeah. no yeah. reason why. But it's, and she appeared to be sitting on a throne. And so from this one single figurine, they created this whole, essentially, cosmology where they were um, a matriarchal society that worshipped female fertility goddesses. And you guys, one figurine figurine does not make a religion. Well, it wasn't even (laughs) all they had. Right. It makes it they makes a point as we go on that the human figurines, especially the whole human body figurines, are actually pretty rare. Most of them are animals or hands or as we talked about, phalluses. Right. Because humans. Yes. <laughs> um so yeah, it was it's a pretty ridiculous thing to make. Although it's to be clear, I like that they gave him a little credit because they basically this was a product of the time. Oh yeah. One thing I thought was hilarious was when they were talking about how the figurines were, you know, they weren't thin. They weren't what we would consider oh, yeah. absolute, you know, attractive. They these didn't days. cater to the male impulse. Yes. And Therefore, like, it wasn't for men. It was it was a sign of matriarchy. Yeah, because men wouldn't have created these because right. they're not attractive. And I'm like, oh, my God. Because our standards of beauty are the only standards that ever existed. <laughs> right. Yeah. So there's a lot of assumptions and again, that's why we are being so sensitive to some of these things we see as assumptions in this too, because these assumptions have been made in the past and they've been very wrong or even incredibly damaging. It's important that we we ask these questions and check each other. And so that's kind of why we're we're kind of focusing on some of this as we go. But as we say, this book actually ends up doing a very, very good job of testing some of these assumptions. Well, and... <laughs> problem with these types of theories and any pseudoscientific theory is that it persists. Right. And it does a lot of damage. Like even today, the these female figurines are maybe the only thing people know about this site when there's so much more. They might not know about Dido. They might not know even that they had, you know, their door was in their roof. They don't know this, but they know about these figurines. And then from that, they extrapolate like that it was a matriarchal society, blah, blah, blah. And it actually has found its way into like new age beliefs and inspirational videos and things like that on YouTube. So people are even today kind of wrapping their identity in this idea that was false. Yeah. From the start. Yeah. Yeah. I I don't remember where I knew this from. I'm not even sure it was from my class or what, but I, for some reason, I thought this was a matriarchal society. And so now we're looking at this and we realize, no, it actually wasn't. Or there is no sign that it was to be more accurate. Right. But we start looking at, well, how were they using these these figurines? Because, you know, there's and in the 41 figurines, uh, we had 54 animals, 23 body parts, and only five of those were human. And they were usually not very well made, it seems, yeah. compared to the others. Right. So they weren't like put on the shelf. You know, they weren't worshipped as far as we can tell. They uh, there was actually an idea that they may have been some sign of animism, which is basically spirits and all things. And so it is the act of creating it was the magic. And then you keep it on you as a token for a while, and then the magic is done, and now it's just something to be discarded. It isn't important anymore. Also talked about how some of it may have represented village elders. So I, I kind of made me think a little bit of um, trading the skulls around, you know, and, and this this may have been a way of calling on or remind remembering these people from the past or the stories that you hear about them. And again, a lot of this, we don't know exactly, but I felt like we were getting on solid ground, more solid ground by having a few possibilities for how this might have, what this might have meant, rather than like before we were getting kind of one usually. Well, and it's really easy to project our modern understandings and the way of doing things now on ancient societies. But as archaeologists, we know 
we have to keep an open mind and try and keep that in check, right. essentially. And there's a direct quote, actually, I, I kind of what you said also. Joyce points out that this it's easy to project our modern understanding of gender onto people, ancient peoples, which means we are always looking for ways that one gender might have dominated the other. And and gender roles are so complicated. They are. Um, and gender itself is more nuanced than some people think. It, it, yeah, there's always going to be overlap. There's always going to be the woman who does what we would consider more masculine. Right jobs or has a more masculine role in society and vice versa. So. We can even look at more recent history for some of that. Um, these things change and we can't work with our current assumptions and put it on the past, even within what we would think of as our recent past. So when we're looking at thousands of years ago, that gets even more problematic if we do that without, especially if we do that without checking ourselves and, and asking ourselves, is this, could it be something else? So we start looking at the division of labor, like you'd mentioned, and I thought this was interesting. There's actually two different kinds of plaster they had used to de designate different areas of their home. So they had a, a sleeping space and they had a working space. And it was maybe a clean and dirty ideal, or it was just, I mean, maybe keeping the sharp tools outside of the place where you're, you're sleeping. You know, I don't. Yeah, they, they would have like different color plaster on their walls and. It, I and the floor too, even though they're yeah. covering them in mats. Yeah, so, yeah. I, I, it was interesting, and I guess when you know they're like we talked about before, you're doing everything in an enclosed space. We don't know where human waste went. We'll have to research that and figure that out. Right. Um. It makes sense to have like dirty and clean areas, and we kind of do this now, right? Like people have mud rooms and things like that at their house, mm -hmm. but. Well, even like the kitchen is kept cleaner than maybe the living room is yeah. sometimes. And, you know, we we kind of do similar things for sure. Yeah. Um, we They note that there is a, a major pest problem, which that makes sense, especially because they described reed containers protect food. I'm like, that's not going to do anything I, for those. Yeah, I noticed that, too. I was like, really? They didn't use clay? They used reed containers? Well, to even, if, even if all they had was reed or that was all that made sense to use, that's not going to stop a... It's not going to stop a rodent not at, at all. all. No, <laughs> but I did like the discussion on how specialization kind of came about with the mm -hmm. advent of the city. Um, you know, you're in an area where you have abundance, and their version of what they consider abundant is very different than our version. Abundant to them is means you know they had what they needed to survive. Now it means essentially opulence, <laughs> right? right. Um, but that's not what we're really referring to when we talk about abundance in this context. And because of that, they were able to spend more time kind of specializing. And because people were coming together, you know, one person may have been really good at making pottery and that became their thing. And then somebody else would have been like, wow, you're really good at making pottery. Teach me. And then this ties back to the identity, possible identity of some of those symbols, mm -hmm. too, because, you know, we are the pottery makers. Here's our symbol that identifies us as we are people who specialize in this. And See how it all comes together. Yep. I like this a little bit about how technology would have actually had a big impact on uh, the daily lives of people, especially Dido in this case. Yeah. We're talking about cooking with clay balls. And so what they were doing, and we've seen this elsewhere too, is people would heat up clay balls or in other places, I know they use stones, and then put those into containers of of water to boil them and heat them and cook them and essentially you'd put them in and then you have to fish them out and you have to put new ones in and this was a very labor-intensive process well during during dido's time or right before her time they figured out how to make clay pots that would actually you could cook with which just completely changed how much free time you had to dedicate to other things. Yeah, Dido could put a pot on the hearth on her version of a stove, let it cook over the fire and go do something else briefly. Yeah, and and that would lead more opportunity to specialize in certain yeah. things too once you have that extra free time. I noted that they said obsidian was a two-day journey, which is very convenient. And this is my, my biggest complaint with this book. They said obsidian is prized for its strong... Sharp cutting edges and reflective surfaces. I knew you were gonna harp I, on that. Tristan. I can't can't accept it. 
<laughs> so for those who don't know, obsidian is essentially volcanic glass. And like glass, it is very fragile. It is insanely sharp when it's worked. It is really cool stuff, but it is not a strong cutting edge. I can't, I, I had to say something. But I knew you were going to It's my only complaint. Latch on to that. My only real complaint. <laughs> so now we talk about a little bit, or we kind of leads us into the next chapter talking about class inequality, essentially. There was one quote. I just want to open with this when we're talking about the social problems in here. <clears throat> here. But though the city's residents suffered through many misfortunes and survived, it turned out that the one hardship they could not endure was coping with each other. I love that quote. And it just it, it resonated with me, which right. is maybe not a great thing. But it, you know, when people are working together, there's a lot that they can survive, right? Mm -hmm. When they have a common goal, a common purpose. But it's when you get to the class issues and the societal kind of issues and whatever the case may be, just human nature that tends so often to cause problems and essentially that's politics right right, right. and so it's uh, a lot of what we see when it comes to these big civilizations collapsing or whatever their downfall it's not necessarily one thing that does it but a lot of times politics is involved some way somehow so we talk about history houses here Which thinking of politics you know, so cool. Very cool. And this also some inconsistency in way things were presented sometimes. They, uh, I think at one point the author says that every building was built was at home, but that wouldn't apply to the history houses, although she I, kind of addresses that a little bit. I think bit. you might say it was originally a house and then it was adapted to this other purpose yeah. eventually. This also, I think, could be considered a, a form of monumental architecture. Yeah. Yeah. I think so. I, I, but, you know, it depends on your definition of architecture, too, I would think. And this is me getting into the weeds. I won't dwell here too long. But the fact that if, say, did this structure look different from the exterior? You know, it, and it's hard to right. say because, like, obviously being built where you go down into the structure, they're all going to be relatively the same or you won't really be able to tell what they look like from the outside which to me is just such a weird concept for a city because how would you know? Like, you know, we know like, oh, that's the Capitol building or, mm -hmm. oh, you know, how would you know? It's so strange to me. But yeah, I guess it kind of depends on your definition of architecture, whether this would be defined as a monumental, uh, an example of monumental architecture. Or if nothing I, else, you could say it's a proto example. It's a uh, people haven't quite worked out that maybe they need this, but it, it feels like it's serv serving a similar purpose. Uh, so for a description for everybody, essentially, these are buildings that had more elaborate wall art, more animal skulls that were painted, uh, more figurines is is essentially they think it was a uh, about forming non-family attachments. So sometimes it may be kind of like a guild house almost, or it may be some other form of non you know, maybe this is just for our neighborhood or something. You know, we don't know exactly necessarily, but these were clearly not built as to be necessarily a lived in place or almost a museum of the community and such. Along the lines of the history houses, you also had the conversation about whether or not this is actually a city. She talks a little bit about how it would have probably been more like a series of villages that kind of existed mm -hmm. within the same area and um they just kind of got mushed together then. yeah so it was different than what we would think of as cities today but then i got to thinking about it and i was like is it right because oftentimes you have like enclaves within cities of communities that have been encompassed yeah. in a city yeah like think yeah. um little italy or chinatown or something like that those are good examples but even more nuanced than that i was thinking of just neighboring towns that the city's grown around yeah yeah and like I started thinking about, you know, I'm originally from South Florida, the gated community mm -hmm, <laughs> kind right. of, you know, it exists within itself and you have your HOA and everything, right. but you exist within a larger city or town. So it's the same, but it's different. Yep. So moving on to our last chapter for today, chapter three, we meet with Ian Hodder again and we start talking about kind of what ultimately happened to Cattle Hyuk. 
So after over a thousand years, it changed a lot. This is the, the main community. And in around 6500 BC, there was some sort of crisis. And we can see this in a lot of burned houses. And this implied violence, but I don't think that's necessarily, I think it was abandonment is what they were actually talking about here. Yeah, because she talks about ritual burning right. and how people, when they would leave things like their dwelling behind, they would seal it and burn the remaining objects. And we see this in other cultures too, but it seems like it was abandoned more slowly and it possibly would have even been kind of imperceptible to like yeah. person living then. Yeah. Um, and at some point they started moving to what they call the East Mound, which is on the other side of the river, I think. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And the, the East Mound is very different, but the, the, the transition would have been hard to see to people living in it because, you know, it's happening over hundreds of years for you, for them. Yeah. Also, they start to see more settlement sites in the surrounding area. So it's almost like people are leaving the city to go live in these satellite areas, urban flight, perhaps. Yeah. And so then the hist then even after it was abandoned, Cattle Hike was used as a cemetery for up to like another 12,000 years or something. Yeah, I think up until pretty recently, which yeah. is really cool to me. <laughs> but further proof that it wasn't a quote lost city as right. well it was more like a transition it wasn't didn't collapse it wasn't lost it just kind of turned into something different yeah and i like how they talk about climate and how that contributed possibly to the change mm -hmm. the transition um the 8.2 climate event you're yes, talking about yeah now. Yes. yeah and how um so the Laurentine ice sheet started to collapse, which released fresh water into the ocean, caused sea levels to rise. Right. And so this, this to be clear too, this happened in North America. It's a whole bunch of melting water just kind of bursts all of a sudden and dumps a whole bunch of fresh cold water into the ocean. Yeah. And I mean, this affects everything pretty much globally because it disrupts the circulation of water mm -hmm. in the ocean and it causes Cattle Hayuk to be more arid. And I thought it was interesting how they discuss that this would be devastating to us today, but there's disagreement amongst archaeologists about how this would have impacted people then if it was actually enough to drive them out of the city there is archaeological evidence that they adapted right. um specifically eight different types of food which we see in other groups as well yeah not necessarily at this time but during drought times like the people are remarkably adaptable but she does go on to talk about how the climatic event may have created more of a divide between the haves and haves nots um yep. of the time which again as i said before it's you more often than not more than one thing that causes the decline of a civilization or mm -hmm. a city and so you can see how the climate ch changes affect the cultural changes as well and how that could be an issue for the people i also appreciated the i think half joke but also maybe a little truth to it idea that people were just tired of climbing up the mound that had grown because you know when you abandon a house and then throw a bunch of garbage on in it and then put a floor on top of that and build another house if over time over 1000 1500 years you're going to actually build up that mound quite a bit and it's presented as a joke but i'm like that you know that might not be that big of a joke either <laughs> it's entirely possible or at least possible that was a factor you know yeah no and i mean you see people i mean i had a friend recently who moved apartments because she was on the third floor and it was a walk up and yeah. she was sick and tired of walking up <laughs> yeah so she moved to another apartment that she was on the second floor and it had an elevator so yeah right so ultimately the exact cause of this culture shift and uh, and abandonment is uh uncertain and I, I appreciated that and we don't know how much a role climate played in it exactly, but we see art expression, architecture, food resources, and the population size all changed during this period. And people either shifted mounds to the east mound or left entirely. And again, we, we talk about maybe seeing a growing wealth gap. Uh, this uh, Again, this is another good example of talking about some of the nuances involved too. So we start with an interpretation that the original Cattle Hayuk on the West Mound was, I think they said, aggressively egalitarian. Yeah. And her conversation about how people were trying to find their individualism and, you mm -hmm. know, their identity and stuff is really interesting to me. 
But I, yeah, go on. Because yeah. I, I, like you said, I think that's a very simplistic Wait. way of looking at it. Yeah. Yeah. Basically having too much was, was taboo essentially is, is what people thought because all the houses are the same. They all have the same things in them. Therefore, everyone is equal and it was not okay for anyone to have too much more than anyone else. But she also discusses how they didn't really have like a government right. structure possibly. And so... And when you're coming from like a, a small community where you take care of everybody, yeah, it makes a sort of sense that that would be, you would try to maintain that system. And if you're coming from an area, you know, coming from a nomadic lifestyle and somebody builds a house like... That, that works for them, <laughs> you're going to do the same thing. So I don't know that it was ne necessarily socially enforced egalitarianism or if it was just kind of convenient. Right. Yeah. And uh, to be clear, I may have uh, messed these up. I think I said earlier they moved to the East Mound where they were actually moving from the East Mound to the West Mound. So if I get that confused at some point, um, know that that's not necessarily what's going on here. But yeah, the West Mound were much bigger. They were two-story homes. They were larger rooms. They had courtyards, larger food uh, storage areas. They weren't burying the dead in the floor anymore. They didn't use bones and skulls in the walls and floor anymore. So this is a pretty big shift in how people lived for, again, whatever reason. And so the assumption, as we said, is that this became less equal. There was more of a, a gap in, in the haves and the have-nots here. And I do appreciate how she discusses the fact that we don't know how these people would have understood or defined social hierarchy. Material goods may not be what defines their social status, exactly. right? Uh, it could be something else. And we, you know, it could be, you know, identity with a certain group of people or access to a certain bank of knowledge that provides you with social status. Right. It might be someone you come to consult about something might be the social status. So yeah, things that don't make it into the archaeological record, which is important. And I thought that was that was good that someone out there is kind of challenging that. They listed a, a few things. Um, we don't know how Cattle Hike residents would have understand social archaeology. The, the signs just may not have lasted. But I want to make it clear that this is not someone saying that this is the way things were. They're just making a case for why we won't, don't want to tie ourselves down to the idea that it was egalitarian. So we don't, again, we don't know, but we want to keep our mind open that it might not have been as egalitarian as some people think and asking those questions so we're ready to accept evidence when it comes forward. Well, and I, again, going back to, you know, some people were moving out and there were people that did not move out. Right. And so remember, your pathways are on the roofs of structures. So you can't just let a house go abandoned and the roof cave in because then your walkway is disrupted. Right. So it's not like today where we walk past a house that's been vacant or abandoned and, and it's nothing more than an eyesore. Um, but as more people moved out, that meant more work for the people that did exist there still because they had to maintain these houses, maintain the cities, maintain the rooftops. And essentially, it just wasn't possibly sustainable any longer. And they may have started left because they couldn't do it all themselves. Yeah, they couldn't do it all themselves. Essentially, the investment in the city was not worth it anymore. And <laughs> I feel like this is uh, why we don't have rooftop sidewalks anymore. <laughs> it was not a sustainable that design. And ladders. I don't miss, I wouldn't. I'm okay not having ladders. Yeah. Yeah. Next, we move into talking about whether Cattle Hayuk was actually city. We kind of alluded to this already, but essentially the things that what they say define a city right now is specialization of production, money, writing, and monuments. And we don't have writing. And as we talked about, we don't really have what we would consider to be monuments. I don't think we really have money, though we're not sure, you know, there could have been some sort of exchange with those. It those seemed... I remember her mentioning like they they didn't have find any evidence of like money, but right. they probably traded bartered. so bartered. Yeah. So they had a system in place that just wasn't what we would. And there was even some question over whether how much specialization of production they had. There were no buildings yeah. dedicated to it. You may have had specialists within the city, but there wasn't like a structure built around that kind of thing. They, that's when the whole term like proto city comes in or a really big town comes in, you know, so exactly how you define it 
is a little up for, up in the air and not very easy to define in this case. But essentially, it doesn't matter for the people involved what how we define it because to them this was just some a uh, new thing then trying to figure out well relatively new like you know a thousand years is not new but figuring out how to adapt to this kind of environment is was a quite a feat and i guess even the definition of what a city is has changed over time and it's a lot of people think of it as a little bit more like they have a more relaxed definition of it now but like you said it doesn't really matter in the long run this this is whether It's it's important for us talking about these sorts of things but when we're talking, when it just comes to knowing about Katahayuk, it doesn't matter too much to yeah. to us as individuals. It was definitely a change, in, a very drastic change in the way people were living their lives. And I think that's the big takeaway. Right. Is things changed. They went from living nomadic lifestyles to living sedentary lifestyles. And um, that affected pretty much everything, every aspect of their lives. Mm-hmm. And then we, unfortunately, we end the chapter, I feel, on one of the, the weaker points of this we talk about a village nearby uh towards the end of cattle Hayuk, and you see influences of it in there and they found a sort of death pit where there were remains of 40 people who may have been sacrificed for this although i wasn't clear for what they said that that's exactly what happened even when she started talking about it and she called it grizzly i and maybe this is just the archaeologist in me I, but when she started describing it, I was like, okay, that's really not that grisly. And you see evidence of this in other cultures as well. And, and then she, she does say later, it wasn't an act of gory violence. It was a ritual to join the people with land. Our understanding of living, dead, animate, and ob- inanimate objects may not have been shared by other people. Yeah. Which, uh, that's last bit at least is fair. But there seemed to be a lot of conjecture about what this meant. It was a, this monstrous flame roaring over a structure made from human bodies. And clay was surely a symbol of the city's might. Any time someone uses surely, I kind of like gets my hackles up. Yeah, agreed. So this read this, what she does here as one possible interpretation of what we're seeing. It's possible if I was to dive into this and really look at the research done on this, I might find out that she has more basis for this than it comes off in the story. But I had a lot of problems with this one in particular, which was kind of a shame because she was pulling pulling it around from a, what seemed like too much conjecture to actually like doing a good discussion of some of the nuances involved and how we, we don't always know exactly. And then we come to this and it feels like we kind of almost dropped it all. Yeah, I don't really I feel almost like the conversation about the death pit could have just been left out. Yeah, it d- actually it, doesn't feel very necessary, it does doesn't it? doesn't really I don't really know what it contributes to the discussion, honestly. Only thing that I thought was important to it was that you can see influences of Cattle Hayuk's culture in in this community and it was a larger than normal town. But other than that, I'm not sure either. Yeah. Okay, well, not to end it on a on a bit of a downer note, but uh so that's the first four chapters of Four Lost Cities. Barbara, what do you think of the book overall? We've we've kind of given our opinion of the content throughout. How do you feel about the book? I have really enjoyed this book, despite the death pit. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. But no, I really enjoy it. Uh, enjoyed it so far. It's fascinating because these are cities that I've heard about and wanted to visit or mm-hmm. have visited. And it's interesting to me how little I actually know about them. So I've really enjoyed this. I think it's really accessible so far. She does a great job of putting herself and the reader in the story and of explaining what could be really, really complicated concepts compared to our previous book. The theory in this one is a lot more accessible. Yeah. And and to be clear with with people uh, reading along or listening along, I guess, even we have it again. This is a different kind of book we're dealing with here. Our first one, which was The Dig, was historical fiction, try to make history come alive. Our second one, which was Captain Kidd's Lost Ship, was a dissertation. It is there to record and and share information. It's not there to be fun to read necessarily. Whereas this book has a few points it's trying to make and communicate to us. And so that makes it, again, a very different beast from our other two books. I'm very excited to see or very curious to see how she wraps this book up. Like if there's any big lessons that we could 
draw on for things that are happening today or anything like that. Uh, one, one thing that did strike me with this book, too, is the sheer amount of information in this. You think, oh, it's a lighter book. It's more fun to read. There is a ton of detail here. I ended up taking a lot more notes than I was expecting to take for something that's kind of a fun read, right? Yeah, I guess that's true. I took a lot more notes too, but it's it's a it's not a difficult read either. No. So you kind of breeze through it and you don't and it's written in such a way that you don't realize all that you're absorbing. So I definitely so, so far much of it has is worked in together so it, it leads from one piece of information to the next. Yeah. It makes sense why we're talking about this now. The introduction of stories when she can or personal anecdotes all are all actually really good techniques for making something more accessible. So I think this is overall, despite we can have some minor complaints about it or completely misrepresenting Obsidian, um, this is a really good book and I'm really enjoying reading this and I'm ready to start on our next one. What What's our next city, by the way, Barbara? You got the book there. Our next city is... Pompeii. Oh, good. I'm really excited about this one just because of the teaser that was uh -huh. provided in the intro. Yeah. How, how different that narrative is from what we are usually presented. And I've, again, the illustration at the beginning of the chapter is pretty epic. Not, oh, my goodness. It is. Remember, we talked about humans and their fallacies, right? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> oh, goodness. Well, I think that wraps us up. I've really enjoyed doing this and i'm uh, like i said i'm looking forward to the next time if you have any comments or questions or if you have something you want to know more about let us know and maybe we can do a quick roundup at the start of our next one but until then we'll see you next time all right happy reading everybody archaeology books for fun is brought to you by the florida public archaeology network a program of the university of west florida you can find out more about archaeology and about FPAN at fpan.us. We appreciate any feedback, so if you're listening to us as a podcast, please leave us a review. And if you're watching this on YouTube, please like and subscribe. Thanks for listening.